You're listening to the Doc Lounge Podcast. This is a place for candid conversations with the healthcare industry's top physicians, executives, and thought leaders. This podcast is made possible by Pacific Companies, your trusted advisor in physician recruitment. I am one of your hosts, Cameron Steinheimer, and I am the marketing manager here at Pacific Companies. I want to welcome everybody to the Doc Lounge podcast by Pacific Companies. I'm your host, Stacey Doyle, Senior Director of Marketing. Uh, thank you for tuning into our Providers Perspective series. This series focuses on a physician or dentist journey through medicine and their learnings and advice that they would give to their peers and upcoming physicians and dentists. Our special guest today on the Providers Perspective series is Dr. Jordan Cooper. He is a dentist, entrepreneur, and best-selling author of Chasing the Blue Marlin, How to Pursue Your Life's Passion and Your Passion for Life. I'm also joined by my co-host, Lisa Shabaro, who is the Director of Business Development mm-hmm. for Pacific Companies. So I want to thank you both for joining today, and, and I want to welcome you both. Stacey. Hi. Hi, guys. How y'all doing? Stacy, Lisa, it's nice to be here. And we're so excited to have you. Um, Dr. Cooper, I'd love just to, you know, learn a little bit about you. And if maybe you can share your, you know, your journey from, from becoming a dentist to an entrepreneur and, and, and best-selling author. Well, um, <clears throat> if you talk about all three of those things, I think a good place to get started is uh, when I went to college. Um, I had a uh, scholarship to go to college, and after about two years of being in at the University of Arkansas, and it's going to happen anywhere, but it happened there for me, I had learned almost nothing, and uh, I was a little disillusioned with school. I was going to class. I had the grades, but I didn't know. I wasn't learning much. I felt like my experience was being wasted, and uh, I had nowhere near Uh, choosing a path for a career and I was kind of complaining about it to a friend of mine and this person said well maybe you should go to a career counselor and I said a career what could they have those and I went and met with this is towards the end of my second year of school I met with a career counselor the first question when I walked in the door he said so what would you like to accomplish by the time you're 65 and here I am I'm 19 years old And I had no clue, you know, how do you answer that question? I was just trying, my thought was, oh, I was trying to party tonight, you know, (laughs) it's all out, you know. And so uh, he said, well, I have a challenge for you. Why don't you go home, take an hour, sit down and write 10 things you'd like to accomplish by the time you're 65. And this moment changed my life because I did that. And they were crazy things. Um, They were things like make a million dollars learn a foreign language, live in a different country. Um, And one of them there was become a dentist. And another one was catch a big blue marlin. And so I I came up with these 10 things and I wrote them down and I hung them on my wall. And uh, after about two or three years, I'd accomplished all of them, but one. And um, so I was going into dental school. I had studied abroad in three countries. I had learned fluent Spanish. And, you know, I had I had done some entrepreneurial things. And so um, life was kind of going along, but I still had one of those goals to accomplish. And um, that helped me give direction for my life and became the uh, a, a good uh, a, one of the principles in, in the book that I wrote later in life. That is that is so cool. I mean, to, to write it down and to really focus and, and have those 10 things is kind of your pillars that you're working towards. Um, I just think that's, that's so, it's just refreshing to hear. Um, they were actually I, hung on okay. the bathroom and uh, the bathroom wall in my college apartment. So I had to look at them every day. <laughs> <laughs> now tell, tell us what was the one that you found the most challenging of those 10 things that you put, you know, you, obviously your, your heart and mind um, towards. Well, I kept striking out with the blue marlin. <laughs> so uh, that became like one of those things that ate at me. And then in the end, uh, that ended up becoming the title of my book um, after finally uh, catching a big blue marlin. And I've caught more big blue marlin since then, um, uh, metaphorically and physically. But it took me until I was 27 before I caught a a, a big boy, put it in the boat. So 
um, that was that kind of plagued me for a while. And so I'm assuming that's really kind of the inspiration behind the book and the title. Obviously, you know, there you can tell us a little bit about what the book is centered around, but um, <clears throat> I'd love to hear more about that. The, the book is really centered around pursuing your passion, but in order to pursue your passion, you can't just go all willy nilly. You know, there's there it's good to have some organization and it's good to sit down and have reflection and have your passion and the things you want to achieve reflect your values. And for me, it was not only financial goals, but family goals and goals that centered around things that I really enjoyed to do for fun, like fishing. So uh, when you can combine all that and you can work towards it, I, since those 10 goals and I accomplished them in a short amount of time, I have rewritten 10 more and 10 more and 10 more several times. And so it, it's pushed me well beyond my uh, my my comfort zone over and over again, but it's allowed me to do some really incredible things in life. And um, so what I have had from that book, I've had hundreds of people uh, can't reach back, back out and say, I set my goals or I did this. I've had my patients come in and show me, they'll unfold their, their goal list and say, Hey, I did this after I read chapter number two, you know, and uh, those things like that means a lot to me. I really, I can tell you, honestly, sometimes you just have to write a book to process something. And for me, I needed to write that book for me. And uh, after I wrote it, I, I really thought that it would be helpful for others. And so you kind of go back and retool it a little bit and you get a publisher and you, and you do that. But a lot of that was an exercise to process a lot of things that I had been through. So I actually wrote that book when I was 35 and I'm 43 right now, but a lot of it has to do with things that happened in my twenties. That's really, I mean, I've, I've definitely heard, you know, writing down and having that, that really kind of laser focus around goals can really, really help. And it sounds like for you, it's been an iterative process where, you know, it's helping you focus and then achieve and then really move on and just kind of keep using that as your, almost your leap spring to the next, the next set of goals. That's right. Even my kids, we do goals and I tell them that the best feeling in the world is that check mark, you know, feels really good. Satisfaction. Now, tell me a little, Dr. Cooper, obviously you, you started your career um, in, in dentistry, and I know that this is somewhat, you know, it's a, also within your family. Tell me a little bit about your background there and, and kind of what you learned in dentistry and then how that led into, obviously, some more of your entrepreneurial um, passions. Well, I've been involved in, in different, a lot of different projects in dentistry. I've, I've started up several clinics from scratch. I've bought clinics. I've sold clinics. We've ran uh, uh, mobile dental programs to schools, nursing homes. I have led mission trips down to Central America. We've done free dental care and medical brigades. And I've been in charge of the dental side several times. Um, so I've had a lot of really cool experiences in, uh, in uh, well, in, a bunch, in several countries, you know, doing dental things. And then I, I'd had a social media company that, that I started in 2007 doing Facebook for dentists. I believe I sold that in 2009. So I was really early to the game on that. But the reason I did that is we were using social media so much to promote our practice here. I was the only dentist in my whole town with a website at that time. So oh, yeah. social me media was right for the picking. So we did that and it was able to, we were able to really grow our patient uh, base during that time. And I thought, wow, if this is so good for my practice, I could probably pass this on to other people. So we made a business out of it. And that was really fun. All those things really taught me, you know, you can, you can get in and if you learn an industry, if you become an expert at something, you go open a lot of doors. And a lot of that is spending, you know, I, I, I think the, uh, the author was, uh, is it Malcolm Gladwell who talked about 10,000 hours maybe. Yeah. And, I've put 10,000 hours into uh, three things, dentistry, fishing, and Spanish. And so <laughs> you, you become an expert at those things. And, and once you, once you know, when you spend a lot of time in something, you see opportunities pop up. I'll give you an example. Uh, two or three years ago, I bought a, web, a URL called teledent.com just because I knew there would be teledentistry at some point. Well, the pandemic happened and somebody cut me a check for that URL for $25,000 over on the East Coast, but I bought it for 10 bucks. 
And it just because I knew the industry and I was just kind of goofing around on the internet on GoDaddy and I found that. And I think in life, that's just kind of a metaphor for the way mm-hmm. life is. When you're an expert at something, opportunities just pop up. And if you're smart, you know, you can play whack-a-mole with every one of them. You know, you can a lot of things you can you can do in life once you arrive to be an expert. And I, I probably won't be an expert at dentistry my whole entire life because that's going to pass me by at some point. And so I think being an expert in more than one thing is actually a really healthy thing to uh, to aspire to. And I think it's really hard for people when you try to balance your life, trying to become experts at things, because that means you spend a lot of focus over here and a lot of these other little things uh, can go by the wayside. And so that was a big challenge for me, how to, how to blend those things into my life rather than try to compartmentalize because... Uh, people get so compartmentalized that the 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 ones that aren't their number one priorities completely fall off. Um, <clears throat> so I'm I'm a father. Um, I have you know recreational things I like to do too besides work. So pulling all that together uh, it take takes focus, and a lot of that is setting your priorities. If you can't set your priorities and and work towards those things in a, in an organized way, um, you'll never get there. I like that. It's it's definitely the the part of balance and then also really kind of capitalizing on both what you're saying, what you studied and, and what you're practicing from a medical standpoint, and then the business side. And so I'd love for you to to kind of talk about, you know, and share with our, our audience um how what what kind of made you say, okay, let me let me also explore the business side of, of this and not just, you know, just the practice piece. Well, when I started uh, practicing dentistry, there was this uh, there was this magazine that came out, and looking back, I know now it was a paid it was a paid ad magazine. But it, the first magazine it was in two thousand six, one of the first ones that hit my desk. You get all these magazines start coming in once you start a dental practice or you're you're a, you're a doctor or a dentist. You have the 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 uh, professional magazines that come in and, and you just kind of go through them and throw them away. And I, this one stuck out to me and it said uh, the, something about the gloom or the looming, it was the glooming wave of corporate dentistry. And it was like a black magazine, like black, like death, as in like this corporate dentistry has taken over your practice and you should be scared. It's fear mongering, right? And and so we had heard all these rumors of group practice and the solo practitioners were going to, you know, you go to the dental meetings at that time. I got out of school and went to a lot of dental meetings and they were like, we're going to stand up to this corporate wave and, you know, all these things. And it's a bunch of, you know, single practice doctors. And, you know, I, I just decided it, it didn't look like it was beatable, you know, it was coming. And so instead of like, trying to fight it it was a way to how to ride that wave you know and so um i started setting up satellite practices while i was working here in this building with my dad and i wasn't very busy here he'd had a small practice for a lot of years and um, so i started the satellite and i worked it part-time and i ended up getting an associate there and that worked out great we're doing you know 1.2 million dollars within the first couple of years and so i said well i could do that again it's repeatable so i picked another town and i went there and did that same thing and so over time we had several practices and nobody had come up with the term dso which means dental service organization which is what we call a group now and they weren't being done because the technology was really barely there to be able to manage a group and, and from a centralized location, and there were a few people doing it. So I did centralized management, and then I ended up selling that business in 2015. And so that was kind of the, that was kind of the, the mindset was, okay, well, if I can't beat them, I'll join them, you know, and this is, this is what's coming. And we were all winging it back then. There was no blueprint. There was no model. There was nobody to copy. And so you make a lot of mistakes, which I did, but luckily, um, through all those mistakes, I guess, because I was the only one around here doing it, we were uh, successful anyway. And we brought that company to sale. And so now after having done it once, I'm doing a similar thing, but in a different way with the private equity group and MB2 Dental, um, we are growing uh, practices, but it's, it's not me going out there personally guaranteeing a loan for $5 million. It's just through a group that we have. I'm part of a group now 
called them B2 Dental and uh, it's private equity back. So it's it's a lot less risk for me, especially now that I'm in my 40s. And it's been it's been a really good system because <clears throat> I was CEO of that group for seven or eight years at, when I when the one I built. And being CEO is a lot of work and the buck always stops at you. And I was getting up early. I got up at 430 in the morning all those years. Um, and I had a meeting at the end of the day and I didn't get done with work till six or six 30 for, for years. And, um, I, I was tired of that. So you can do that, but you'll burn out. And so finding a better way to do it, um, with the management team and all that has been really great for me. So, um, I'm doing it better this time, if that makes any sense. It, no, it does. I love that. Tell me, tell me a little bit more about it in its MB. Two, tell me how it's structured. MBO, tell me. It's all right. So it's a it's a really unique model in dentistry. There's there's some people copying us uh, right now. In fact, uh, a lot of people because I do some consulting calls uh, with people asking a lot of questions of what is our model, and um, <clears throat> we are the largest uh, dental partnership organization in the country, maybe the world. Um, it's a uh, it's a group of 600 dental offices. I joined when we were under 100, and um, we've just continued to grow. And what a dental partnership organization is, is different than a dental services organization because a dental partnership organization, every dentist has equity in their practice. So you don't own 100% of your practice, but you own some significant portion of your practice. And then the, the parent company owns a portion. What that does is it creates alignment. So... Uh, you're all looking for the same thing. You're looking to grow that business, have profitability and have cash to share. And so my problem on my first model was I owned all the practices hundred percent. And so um, <clears throat> not everybody was concerned about my bottom line. Every individual office needed to perform at a level of profitability. And if the dentist wasn't on board with that, cause they were getting a check either way, then uh, I had a hard time driving profit so and, and with our company everybody's got skin in the game and it's been that model has been proven now for several years that dentists will continue to perform and grow their practices even if they own if they own a fraction of their practice and and the private equity company has the other part through the holding company with uh, mv2 so uh, we're all on the same team and that really works does that make sense it does and are you are you actively trying to find additional, um, you know, different uh, offices and, and clinics that want to come on board or how does that work? Yes. So MB2 is very selective in their partnerships. I believe we take maybe 5% or maybe 10% of the people that we look at joining our group. And that has to do with a few things. Uh, number one, the person, we make sure that they're a cultural fit with our company and we're a unique culture. And so that's really important to us with certain core values that we we don't compromise on. Um, the second thing is, you know, financial profitability. Because we're a quickly growing company, we can't afford to partner with people who aren't running a successful business already because we don't have time to to repair or fi fix things that are broken or or find a distressed practice and rehabilitate it. So um, we partner with successful dentists um, who have that drive and that that vision of where we all are trying to get to. If there are, you know, dentists listening right now that are interested in, in, you know, having conversations or, or pursuing and connecting with you, what is the best way for them to do that? Well, um, I would love to talk to them. I've onboarded a lot of people into MB2 and uh, we've done several practices in my home state and I've worked in several other states and I'm about to be creating over the 23, 24 and 25. My goal is to create a group in Nashville, Tennessee. So I'm going to be traveling there quite a bit. Um, I wanted to ask and, and Lisa or or Dr. Cooper, feel free to, to chime in here. Um, wh what are you seeing in terms of within um the dentist and staffing you know um just marketplace are are there a lot of dentists that are you know available or is it also as, as similar with on the physician side where we're seeing you know obviously a shortage in, in in staffing nationwide i feel like that is probably uh very geographical in nature so in the more uh, urban areas, you have a higher concentration of dentists and things that way across the country. But also there's some states like Arkansas who have no dental school. So 
um, in those cases, we have to import our talent. And so um, a case by case basis on that provider thing, there are some areas that are saturated, but Dennis, um, with staff, you know, we had uh, quite a bit of people just like nursing, who people who hung it up during COVID because they were tired of all the nonsense. And I think, um, I, I think that's starting to be replenished. You know, I had to train quite a few people um, after that. And uh, I think uh, some dentists retired, you know, and I don't blame them. Some older dentists that I don't want to be breathing all that COVID for three years. And so I get that too. Um, my dad had retired in 2019, right before all that happened. Um, but uh, I was, I was really glad he retired before all that, all that mess. So I think the industry is like that. There's the dental schools are really profitable. The average tuition is about three hundred fifty, four hundred thousand dollars, and so there's private dental schools popping up. So they because they know there's there's money in it now, and so I feel like that will balance itself out in the next maybe ten or fifteen years. But you do have a lot of boomers retiring at the moment, so that is creating a demand. Creating a huge demand and a huge challenge for getting dentists incentivized, especially for our community health center. Stacy, that's something that we've launched a huge project on, of course, the Pacific companies to try to create access to dentists and to help them with offsetting some of that debt since those uh, community health centers are able to offer student loan repayment because that is a huge thing. Yeah, right. that's yeah. really, that's cool that y'all do that because it's so important. When you get out of school, it's very daunting when you come out of school making you know, hundred thousand dollars or hundred twenty thousand dollars, and you have expenses, life. Maybe you're married. Maybe you have kids, and you've got debt to to pay. And you know, you're making very little money, and you're looking at that mountain of debt. And you, you it's very common to talk to young people, and they're they're disillusioned because of that amount of debt. They really don't see a way out. They feel trapped. And so, any way to relieve some debt is very very. Uh, uh, attractive to young providers. And I, I feel like, Stacy, we could almost do a second part where um, Jordan can maybe help some of the dentists out there practicing on their own, wanting to grow their practice to increase some things, increase the amount of revenue that they create to help offset that debt. But when we're consulting and bringing clients and health centers up to date on what the market's doing, year over year, there was an $86,000 a compensation increase and a lot of a lot of clients have batted an eye on that but as we explained to them as jordan just alluded their tuition costs are astro astronomical and so it has to be offset and of course you see a higher compensation student loan repayment things of that nature but you also have those dentists who have come out started their own practice and i feel like um, jordan's ability to help coach some of these people up a bit can help them to increase revenue and help tackle some of the student debt and maybe someday be profitable enough to be looked at by MB2, right, Jordan? <laughs> right, yes. Uh, I've had several <clears throat> dentists really want to join MB2. I had one come by here uh, last week and uh, he was visiting a practice in Missouri <clears throat> and he called me and said, hey, I'm, I'm in your area, can I come by? And I said, yeah, sure. And he said, okay, I'll be there in five hours. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he drove down here and um, he, we looked at him when we talked about everything, but he didn't have real, any any real employment history longer than six months. He bounced around a little bit, <clears throat> maybe at a nine month, but it doesn't matter. But uh, he didn't have a long enough history to, to really uh, even be thinking about you know, joining MB2 and becoming a, a doctor owner with us and that kind of thing. He just need to, to really get in his groove, prove himself, uh, get his systems down, have a good working knowledge of, of business before, before trying to bite that off, you know, and it's a lot of people. And, and I understand this, you can get the cart in front of the horse because I nearly did when I started building clinics and taking on all that debt and stuff, because then you have to operate yourself out of that. But I, I think this guy was, uh, he's a, a West Coast guy and he's an orthodontist and he's going to be fine. And he's a smart guy, but he just didn't have that, any kind of track record. And I think when you want to, you want to get some debt paid down, get understand cash flow. I mean, understanding cash flow is super important. 
if uh, if you've been living on student loans for eight years, you don't understand cash flow. <laughs> and that was a uh, that was an issue that I had too uh, coming out of school. So I had to really understand cash in and cash out uh, right out of school for sure. I love that. I think that's great advice for, you know, new grads. Um, and I think that's something that, you know, really resonates, you know, get some experience and then kind of learn the business side a bit. Um, and then like you're saying, then you can kind of take these next steps um, and, and you know, work with potentially work with organizations, um, you know, like MB2. Um, so I think that thank you for for bringing that up, both Lisa and, and Dr. Cooper. Um, I know a lot of new grads are, you know, they're at that point where like, okay, now what? Um, and I think we had a previous episode where we went into a little bit about financial literacy, because I do feel um, you know, for, for all our physicians and APPs and dentists, they, they are spending so much time, you know, educating themselves and learning and, you know, they don't get some of the business side of things. And then it's kind of like they're thrown out, you know, into start practicing. And, and that's a big component to, like you're saying, kind of this successful life and, and this balance of, of everything you've talked about. Um, yeah, I, I would, I want to add something interesting here. <laughs> I was the CE chair of the state of Arkansas for three years from 2012 to 2015. And so I planned all the CE events twice a year. So I hired the speakers and I did all that. And I can't tell you, it's more than counting on two hands, uh, how many times older dentists came up to me upset about the programs that I had chosen because they talked about business or team building. They said, we want nuts and bolts dentistry. And it, it, it's, it's kind of, it's, 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 I don't understand that mentality because um, you're, you're not only performing nuts and bolts dentistry as a dentist, and this is where dentistry can, and you know, any, any business is, is challenging, but you're, you're also running a business, you're doing what you do and you're managing people. So you've got some HR. And if you don't understand how to build team dynamics, you'll never have an office. I had one guy say, I've only got two employees. What do I need this for? You know? And you'll never get to where you have seven, eight, and we have 25 in this office. And you can't, if, unless you understand how to build a team, you'll always have two or three employees and you won't have a team to manage. So uh, it's funny because a lot of dentists, at least the traditionally don't, don't like to talk about business. They don't like to talk about advertising and they don't like to talk about team building for whatever reason. I think, no, I think having that hat and wearing, you know, obviously the, the, the marketing and the business side, something you've mastered, but is, is important, um, you know, for, for everybody in, in our audience to, to learn about, I'd love to hear a little bit about your journey, um, and, and becoming an author. Like that's no small feat to, to write a best-selling book. <clears throat> any, any advice or any thoughts to anybody that may want to, you know, pursue that as well? I, you know, I kept artifacts and I had a, had a file that was about this fat. And uh, over the years, I thought, you know, I, I that original list that I hung on my bathroom wall when I was in college, I saved that. It's all beat up uh, and ripped, but I saved it. It's actually, I took a photo of it and put it in the book. But uh, I, I had notes and I had things I wanted to discuss. And when I had a free week at some point in time and I set all those notes on a table and I, I was able to sit down and write a hundred pages of that book in one week, just out of my heart because it had been in there for so long. And that, that was easy. <laughs> now, uh, editing that and turning that into a 150 page book and putting it on the right uh, education level and all that was tedious and you'd think, because I'm a dentist, I like tedious things, but I don't. And uh, that was that took me 12 months of editing. And I put a timer on it, honestly. I set a date on my Google calendar. And when it popped up and said, you've spent 12 months, stop. I sent it off to be published because I didn't want to spend my whole life trying to get that perfect. It was an exercise and satisficing. That um, was good enough, and I sent it. So uh, I, I think... Um, it's all stuff that I cared about. It's all stuff that I was passionate about. And it was stuff that I was saying to myself as much as I was saying it to anyone else. And I, so that made it easy to, easy to invest myself into the book. And I think as long as you're passionate about something and you feel it and you feel it's something that you do know about, uh, you can get involved in that and stay involved in it. I think it's when people 
are are you know full of it uh, you know it's hard to finish a book if you don't really mean it you know and finishing anything whether it's a business deal or a book the devil's in the last five percent you know and getting it done and that was the hardest part for me and i think other you you can meet you'll meet if you ask 100 people on the street five of them have started writing a book but nobody's ever finished it you know and that's i think that's the thing I like it. No, I'm excited. To, I'm excited to read it. Um, and I think uh, just the title itself sounds, you know, something that I think everybody, you know, would would enjoy to to read and, and get something out of. Um, and well, talk. I, I hope you enjoy it. Uh, while you when you're reading it, remind yourself this was written uh, in my 20s and early 30s. <laughs> <laughs> Which makes it even cooler. And and speaking about passion, I wanted to bring Lisa in here because, you know, you have been so passionate about, you know, communities and everybody having access to um, quality dental care and just really being an advocate for dentists and 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 kind of, you know, their compensation and 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 all that um, with community health centers and things like that. So Lisa, I'd love to just hear kind of about your passion and, and why this is an area that you really developed here at Pacific Companies. As we had addressed in, in our training recently, Stacy, there's a huge need for, for dentistry. And when the World Health Organization did their oral health report and, and, and put together and, and findings that should have been known, should have been duh. But when they look at all of the systemic issues that can stem from poor oral health, then you look at the limited access and availability of oral health services to individuals in, in impoverished communities places that a lot of dentists don't typically want to go, that's near and dear to my heart, of course, because of my time with the U.S.-Mexico Border Health Commission and the Secretary of Health for Mexico, right, where I worked on uh, increasing access and public health promotion along the U.S.-Mexico border. And so this mimics that. It mimics the creating access to services they might not otherwise have. Dentists don't wake up and decide, oh, I think I'll go practice in Lena, Arkansas. They don't get out of med uh, medical school or dental school and decide, I think I want to go practice in Brownsville, Texas. And so our goal is to help um, create the vision of what it can be like to practice in some of these communities that are truly beautiful communities. I've covered in all 50 states now throughout my career. I've been to Alaska, places that you're just, you're in awe. I would never have gone there. I would never think to go there. But now I pause and reflect and think, you know, I could see myself living here. This is gorgeous. This is beautiful. It's a different kind of appreciation for life. And that's what we're looking to do with dentists. As we talked about, a lot of the things that our, our health centers have to offer is student loan repayment. They can't offer the, you know, the three, four hundred thousand dollar salaries that a lot of dentists being offered out there, but they can offer great quality of life, work-life balance, and student loan repayment in a lot of instances. And some of these communities are just communities that you've got to see them to appreciate the beauty that they have. It's not the same your Dallas, Texas. It's not your your uh, Fort Worth, Texas. But there's some beautiful places that I absolutely have no problem seeing time and time again. And we want to help open that up to dentists who aren't considering that. We want them to at least pause and think about it and know that they're going to a community that they're going to be embraced with open arms. Well said, and thank you for really, you know, being an advocate and just a visionary on that. And, and and again, like you're saying, some of this information, it does make sense when you hear about it, how, you know, linked oral health is to overall health and well-being and and people not being able to, to have access to that. So um, we're so excited that you're leading that here, um, you know, business development at Pacific Companies. Um, Dr. Jordan, I would just like to leave the ending to you. Um, any last tips or pieces of advice for any dentist or any, you know, anyone looking to, you know, model themselves after kind of what you've done in your career? Oh, I would say don't model it after me. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, you have to pursue your passion. Everybody says that. And uh, my passion is not teeth. And that's the honest truth. It's not. I like doing dentistry fine. I like doing mechanical things just fine, but I love people and I've really enjoyed building this team here. So if you have to do a job and you're doing teeth and I had this office that had three employees and now we have 25, I guess my passion in this business has actually been growing the team. And um, when I joined the team with MB2, I met, I met a whole bunch of other me's out there and that was great. I found my tribe, you know, and there's something to be said for that. I would say pursue your passion find your tribe, never quit. 
and you're, you're, you're going to die. So do some stuff. You know, I'm, I'm, I find it crazy that people sit around and watch TV. Uh, okay. That's fine. I watch a little TV, but you're watching other people live their lives on reality shows. So, dude, you're going to die. So th- that has to create some sort of ur- sense of urgency. <laughs> Lisa, you're laughing at me. I see you. <laughs> it has it's to like, create urgency it's, it's in your just, life. It's truth, right? Sometimes you have to give the raw truth for it to really hit home. And you're absolutely right. Why spend yeah. it watching as the world turns? <laughs> it sounds kind of morbid, but I, it crosses my mind at least once a day that I'm not going to be here forever. And so you have a limited, finite amount of time to do a lot of things. And so uh, becoming efficient, setting those goals, checking them off one by one, all that stuff is going to give you a fuller life. Because when you get to the end of the of your life, if you've done all these things, you feel like you've lived one or two or three lives all jammed into one or more. And I, I hope that other people can feel that too. And, you know, become an expert at something, you know, and have fun because experience is, is something people people forget now in this, this world of virtual things all the time. You know, getting out there and living is, is super important to being healthy and having a, a positive mindset and bringing good things to the world. It's, 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 um, it, it's a much more fulfilling world if you're out there in it. That is, I can't think of a better way to end this um, and really just holistic health and well-being and, and just living your life. So um, thank you so much. And and for our audience, again, um, the, the book um, that Dr. Cooper has authored is Chasing the Blue Marlin, How to Pursue Your Life's Passion and Your Passion for Life. So I want to thank you, Dr. Cooper. and Thank you to all of our listeners. If you would like to be notified when new episodes air, make sure to hit that subscribe button. And a big thank you to Pacific Companies. Without you guys, this podcast would not be possible. If you would like to be a guest, please go to www.pacificcompanies.com. Thank you.